Hello and welcome everyone back to our second day. Welcome to everyone in the room and to those joining us on Zoom for Making Up Selves the Operating Instructions, a symposium to explore how voice, narrative, rituals and imagination from antiquity to present day are practiced in the making of ourselves. My name is Sonam Katru. I'm an assistant professor of religious studies at the University of Virginia. I would first like to thank, um, my, my job right now is very brief and I'll, I'll make way for our distinguished um, uh, Professor Ivana Petrovich from Classics who will introduce our speaker. But I would first like to thank all those who have helped to make this event possible. My colleagues in the Classics Department, Ivan and Andrei Petrovich, and Janet Spittler in Religious Studies, who were my core collaborators in helping to conceptualize and realize this event. I'd like to acknowledge the generous support of our co-sponsors, the University of Virginia, Democracy Initiatives, Religion, Race and Democracy Lab, and the Page Barber Funds. And I'd really like to thank, as I, as I named her yesterday, the wizard in residence, Ashley Duffalo, without whom none of this would be half as elegant and certainly not possible. So thank you, Ashley. Before we begin, a few housekeeping notes for our in-person audience. Please silence your phones if you haven't yet. And as I say this, I, I must do this myself. As a reminder, we are videotaping the event and it's synced to our Zoom live stream. We will allow time at the end of the event for Q&A and we'll field questions from the room as well as from the Zoom online audience members. This is for you. Please post your questions in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to incorporate them. But now, without further ado, I'd like to invite my esteemed colleague, Professor Ivana Petrovich of Classics, to introduce our distinguished guest, Sarah. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Sonam. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Sarah Els Johnston. And um, let me just start by saying that when uh, Janet Spittler uh, Sonan Katru, uh, Andrew Petrich, and I first started uh, talking about organizing an event about the practices of self. Um, when it came to candidates uh, from classics, uh, Sarah was uh, immediately uh, at the top of uh, my list and, of course, Andrew's list. And so um, I would, instead of uh, providing a typical introduction going uh, through CV in detail. I just want to talk about uh, why Sara is uh, so perfect for this event and what aspects of her work uh, speak to us um, now um, most persuasively. Uh, first of all, I mean, uh, Professor Alice Johnston is a distinguished professor of religion and professor of classics and com comparative studies at The Ohio State uh, University. And in her own words, uh, Sarah is interested in the question of how people come to hold the religious beliefs that they do, really the essential question. What makes us believe in God or gods or demons or angels or saints or ghosts or ifrits, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, uh, or banshees or really anything else? So uh, for me and uh, Andre, it was re really uh, Sarah's recent book, uh, The Story of Myth, um, which was so uh, eye-opening for the present uh, topic. Uh, the book uses approaches from folklore studies, narratology, media studies, and the social sciences to better understand the ways in which myths in the vivid forms in which they were narrated in ancient Greece, contributed to the creation and sustenance of belief in the ancient gods and heroes. So the book is a must read, not only for classicists, but really for anyone interested in the way belief in superhuman characters, let's call them that, is created and sustained. Um, and I'll just read some uh, aspects of my rather gushing uh, review of the book um, to just persuade you to go and buy it immediately if you haven't already. So in her book, Johnston shows that it was precisely the emotional investment and attachment that made stories about the gods and heroes into an effective conduit for forging and strengthening religious belief in ancient Greece. And in order to demonstrate this thesis, Johnston relies on recent studies of effects of engaging narratives on emotion and cognition. So after first uh, clearly outlining 
um, uh, her aims in the project and her definition of myth, um, Sarah proceeds to show how the ritualist approach uh, to the study of religion not only divorced myth from ritual, but also relegated myth to the secondary and ancillary status, while bringing things done at the temple to the fore of the scholarly investigation of polytheist religions. So uh, Johnston really turns to the subject of her investigation, the myth as told by the ancient Greek poets. And she argues that in the hands of a skillful poet, stories about the gods and heroes work by prompting the audiences to open themselves to realities that could not be experienced by normal means and to gradually, gradually embrace the idea that gods and heroes were present among them, acting and affecting the courses of mortal lives. Uh, she uses Joshua Landy's concept of formative fiction and Tanya Lerman's uh, research on the vineyard, vineyard congregations of the evangelical church. Uh, Landy has shown how narratives can change the way uh, in which people decide what is real by teaching them to stop relying only on their senses as guides. And Lerman uh, studies the way in which members of the Vineyard congregation use fiction, among other means, in order to condition themselves emotionally and cognitively to feel the presence of God. In addition, Johnston adduces the studies of parasocial relationships, which remarkably demonstrate that all humans have a capacity to form emotional relationships uh, and cognitive attachments uh, with figures with whom there can be no bilateral social relationship, regardless of whether they are real or fictional. It could be Sherlock Holmes, it could be Beyonce, it could be Jesus. So uh, Johnston draws attention to the aspect of Greek myth that most scholars of Greek religion really strip away in their analysis the skillful narration and poetic embellishment. So instead of reducing myths to essential narratives, Johnston argues that scholars of Greek religion should actually focus on precisely on the ways in which well-executed storytelling not only draws the audience in, but uh, emotionally and cognitively conditions the listeners to accept the existence of persons whom they cannot grasp with their senses, and what is more, to form attachments to them. And uh, I could go on and on and on. Uh, Johnston also shows uh, what are the particularly important and effective aspects of specifically ancient Greek uh, storytelling, such as episodic narration, the cumulative uh, building of the Greek mythic story world, the plurimediality of Greek mythic characters and their accretive characters. But uh, I think it's best that you just read uh, the rest uh, in her excellent and really mind-blowing book. So forthcoming, and this is uh, very interesting, and uh, I see a great challenge, really, is the sort of putting of this in practice, uh, if I may say so um, myself. So Sarah, is, uh, Sarah has written uh, a book about uh, Greek myth in which she retells uh, Greek myths for modern audiences. The book is called Gods and Mortals, Ancient Greek Myths for Modern Readers. And Sarah is now working on a book uh, that looks at the reasons why audiences have had a seemingly endless appetite for horror stories with particular attention to the ways in which these stories fulfill some of the same functions as religions do, and especially to the ways in which they support or challenge belief in supernatural uh, entities. Of course, among Sarah's massive body of published work, uh, particularly, uh, there particularly uh, stand out monographs on the goddess Hecate, on encounters between the living and the dead in the ancient world, uh, on Greek divination, and with Fritz Graf, uh, a monograph on the Orphic uh, tablets. And of course, her edited volumes and articles are too numerous to, to account for. So we are, of course, extremely excited, and I hope I could explain why, uh, to have Sarah here uh, at UVA uh, and look forward very much to her talk uh, on yet another awesome topic. I have massive project envy uh, whenever I see uh, what Sarah has done and is doing, namely narrating reality in Greek magical papyri. Sarah. Well, thank you so much, Ivana. Um, and I am so pleased to be here. 
there are people in the audience who I first encountered in graduate school. There are people whom I have met much more recently, but so many of you are friends in so many different ways and people whom I admire. I'm really extremely pleased to be here and I appreciate all that was done to organize this conference and certainly appreciate Ashley as well. The topic I'm talking about today is something that I started dabbling with about a year and a half ago and then I realized it was perfect for this conference and so I finished or more or less finished it. I don't know whether it's ever really done, for a reason that will become apparent as I start speaking. I've been working, uh, I guess since the beginning of my um, career actually, on what are called the ancient Greek magical papyri. I'm going to refer to them in this paper as the PGM, which is an abbreviation for papyri, graikai, magikai, which is what the scholars call them. There's about a hundred of these papyri. Some of them are short, some are long. All of them were composed in Egypt between the first and the seventh century CE. We call them Greek because they're written in the Greek language, which was the lingua franca of the time. But we don't really know exactly who was composing them other than that we're willing to call them magicians. Each papyrus is a compilation of spells collected by that magician, whoever it was that put them together into the papyrus. A few papyri seem to focus on one particular type of magic, um, divinatory magic, for example, but most of the papyri are grab bags of love spells, spells to ensure victory at the chariot races, charms to restrain anger, um, charms for causing someone to have a certain kind of dream, and so on. So like many scholars who work on the PGM, I've often been frustrated by the fact that they evince no clear theological structure or system of rules. Even within a single papyrus, and sometimes even within a single spell, there's no apparent hierarchy of the many gods and demons who appear under a dizzying array of epithets and adjectives, and no clear conceptualization of how a spell is expected to work, why it is working. Now, you can say that this is true of religion more generally, that if we were to look at any given local practice of Christianity, for example, it might be hard to determine whether God or Jesus or a favored saint is understood as being most likely to respond to worshipers' needs and in what manner they are expected to do so. And I would agree with that, but I perceive this as being more strongly the case within the PGM, where within a single spell we meet, for example, Osiris, the king of the underworld, the lord of embalming, Althabot, we don't know who that is, Sabaoth, Althonai, great Eu, who is very valiant, Michael, the mighty angel who is with God, Anubis, some unnamed goddesses, and Toth, the great, the great, the wise. We can invoke the principles of bricolage and syncretism to explain how such a culturally broad span of entities was assembled within a single space. But such concepts don't take us very far in understanding how someone would react to the whole, how someone would have made sense of this, and how it supported their own magical goals. A recent paper by Radcliffe Edmonds, which argues that the spells of the papyri are directed not to potential clients as a sort of advertising, as some scholars have assumed, but rather directed to the magicians themselves, prompted me to formulate my old question in a new way. If the audience for the spells that we see in the papyri are the magicians, then we must assume either that the things that sometimes confuse me didn't bother the magicians because they possessed knowledge that I don't, or that the magicians weren't experiencing these spells in the way that I had always presumed they were. Regarding that first possibility, like many other people, including Radcliffe Edmonds in this article, I've approached the PGM as something analogous to a cookbook. And each spell is a recipe that lays out what the cook needs to do. I assumed, as many others have assumed, that anything that wasn't clearly spelled out was probably something that the magician already knew. Just as I know that egg whites need to be brought to room temperature before they're beaten, and that it's best to do so in a copper bowl. Or that some spells were written as a sort of code, like a well-guarded family recipe for fried chicken to prevent other people from stealing their secrets. 
I think the cookbook approach gets us partway towards understanding why the papyri are often confusing. But I also want to think about that second possibility I mentioned, that the magicians weren't bothered by what bothers me because they were experiencing these spells differently from the way that I thought they were. Or at least they weren't experiencing them only in the way that I thought they were. Certainly, the magicians looked at the spells as a way of obtaining power that would enable them to do things, arouse lust in people, damage enemies, foretell the future, and so on. But what if the reading or speaking of the spell was also in and of itself part of the magician's reward? To continue with the cookbook metaphor, what I mean by that is this. When I sit down to leaf through one of my nicer cookbooks, say, one by Yotam Adelengi, <laughs> I'm not only looking for a dish to serve my dinner guests, but also relishing the lush photographs in the book, marveling at the menus that Adelengi has put together, which I will never, ever have the time to recreate myself even if I can find all of the recondite ingredients that he calls for, and drawing strength from the confirmation that there is a power out there in the foodiverse who continually produces a bounty of flavor and beauty from which I hope to draw a small part myself. Speaking non-metaphorically now, what I want to think about is the possibility that the narrative richness of the spells the very thing that has often confused me with its panoply of entities, epithets, imagery, and allusions to stories, disposed the magicians to experience the cosmos and the viability of their own practices within it in a manner that reinforced their belief in its power and in the availability of that power. When this idea initially occurred to me, I went looking for other magical practices that might confirm it and help me develop my hunch. And now you're going to find out why I hastened to finish this paper for this occasion. The work that helped me most was Tanya Lerman's 1989 Persuasions of the Witch's Craft, which I had read when it first came out and then kind of put in the back of my mind. Um, but anyway, uh, this book, which limbs the practices of several overlooking groups of ritual magicians in London in the 1980s. And from now on, I'm going to say Tanya. I'm not going to do the scholarly thing and say Lerman. I'm just, it seems ridiculous to do that with her sitting in the audience. These groups first appealed to me as comparanda for the PGM because they seemed to me to have a similar worldview as the magicians whom we glimpse there. For example, the, magician practiced by, uh, the magic practiced by Tanya's magicians has no formal dogma and few fixed customs. Within a given group of magicians, there is a more or less coherent body of ideas that govern practice, but individual magicians use them differently. Underpinning all of the ideas and customs that these groups embrace is the bedrock assumption that the entire world is patterned and meaningful. Chance does not exist, and all change is intentional, guided by higher beings. What I'll focus on for most of the rest of this paper is how two specific practices that Tanya observed to be central to her groups can help us better understand that narrative richness of the PGM that captured my attention. These are narrative absorption and visualization. Narratives were crucial to Tanya's groups. They read and reread certain novels, such as Marion Zimmer Bradley's The Mists of Avalon, Mary Renault's The King Must Die, The Lord of the Rings, the Chronicles of Narnia, and so on. Books that portray, that vividly portray an enchanted cosmos and characters who have the agency to effect change within it. By doing so, these magicians were immersing themselves within a worldview that confirmed that they, as individuals, could affect change within it. By doing so, um, oh, sorry, by doing so, the magicians also created vivid narratives of their own that were read aloud during rituals. I think I missed a slide change. No, there it is, I'm sorry. Uh, that were read aloud during rituals. These were populated by characters from the books I just mentioned, by mythological characters such as Caridwen, Hecate, and the Virgin Mary, and by historical figures such as Sir Francis Drake. Sometimes, characters from more than one narrative world appeared together. These narratives were also deliberately laced with poetic, picturesque language and sensorily rich descriptions of things seen, things heard, things felt. 
By Tanya's understanding, the rich descriptiveness enabled the magicians to suspend themselves within the world of the story. When the story was told during a ritual, it became a vehicle that carried participants through its stages. It's important to stress that the images in the stories created by members of the group and the way in which those images are juxtaposed are evocative of the nature of the characters and the powers or ideas that they represent rather than exegetical or logical in our normal sense of that word. One participant, for example, reported that while he was reciting a narrative about Sir Francis Drake's visit to the Andes, the story was overlaid for him with the imagery of the redemptive blood shed during the martyrdom of Aslan in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. The point of these stories was not to relay a single linear narrative, but rather to create contexts in which an age-old power of some sort, which is often left relatively undefined, plays a central role. Over time, as Tanya put it, the magicians acquire an experience-based concept of power under different guises. Each experience allows the magician to build an experience-based understanding of what that power is, while allowing its more abstract definition to remain opaque. The gradual acquisition of a better understanding of power subsequently aids the magicians in their work. The other concept I want to accentuate, visualization, is closely linked to narrative absorption, indeed overlaps with it in certain ways. Visualization is the practice of seeing vivid mental images, which are often conceived as the link between the subtle ethereal powers that the magical ritual is meant to call into action and our own ordinary physical world. The ability to bring the powers that a story narrates through into our world depends upon the magician being able to visualize that happening. Magicians train themselves in this through exercises known as pathworking, a guided exercise in which one person narrates a story to a deeply relaxed audience that sits in a darkened room with their eyes shut and strives to experience that story's events. Like the narratives that I was talking about a moment ago, path-working narratives are sensorially rich with description. As the story is being told and the participants are visualizing it, they understand their imaginations to be shaping and directing the power described in that story. At the story's climax, the power is released. As Tanya puts it, I suggest that the imaginative rhetoric used to describe the magical rituals may be instrumental in engendering the practitioner's confidence in the significance and validity of that practice. I would argue that the rhetoric of the practice may elicit an ease with the involvement by presenting the practice as non-ordinary but significant, and that it does so by giving the terms of that practice, such as power, some ontological weight while leaving the reference of the terms vague but simultaneously giving practitioners an experiential sense of that reference. I suggest that the same thing as what Tanya describes was accomplished by many of the descriptive or narrative passages in the PGM, even if the ancient magicians were not as much aware of such effects as Tanya's subjects were. I'll turn now to highlighting some instances of these phenomena within PGM-4, which is often called the Great Paris Magical Papyrus after the fact that it now resides in the Bibliothèque Nationale. It dates to the fourth century CE. I'm choosing to focus on just one papyrus, that is, the collection of just one magician, in the presumption that by doing so, I'm able to look at the creative and imaginative expression of a single practitioner and thus better approximate what any given magician would have experienced. I chose PGM-4 in particular because it is our longest and richest papyrus. Most of the other ancient magical papyri could have been used as examples to some extent as well. I'll focus on demonstrating how PGM-4 includes the following. Narratives that convey an underlying sense of an enchanted world and the characters who had the agency to affect change. Vividity of description, that is, the poetic picturesque language and sensorily rich descriptions of things heard, things seen, things felt, that allow the magician to suspend himself within the story. By the way, I keep saying he, him, he, him. 
because we have no evidence for female magicians. Maybe they were there and just weren't talked about. Three, narratives that encourage us to visualize a particular scene of, or yeah, particular scene of power through which that power can be brought into our world. Narratives that convey a sense of unnamed or relatively undefined power that nonetheless has an ontological and functional weight. So, narratives that give the sense of an enchanted world and characters that affect change. Um, I should add that in the passage I'm about to read, you'll probably see already instances of the three other things that I mean to talk about today, but right now I'm going to focus in this passage just on number one, this uh, in its entirety very lengthy document to the waning moon. I'm just excerpting part of it for you. Thrice bound goddess, set yourself free. Come rage against him, and you insert the name of your victim there. For Clotho will spin out her threads for you. I now adjure you by this potent night in which your light is last to fade away, in which a dog opens, closes not its mouth, in which the bar of Tartarus is opened, in which forth rages Cerberus armed with a thunderbolt. For stir yourself, Mene, who need the solar nurse, guard of the dead. You I implore, maid, by your stranger beams. You I implore, O cunning, lofty, swift, O crested one, who draws swords, valiant, healer, with forethought, far-famed, goading one, swift-footed, brave, crimson, darkness, brimo, immortal. And more names for the goddess follow, including, O leader of hosts, O goddess of Dodona, of Ida, grim-eyed, shrill-screaming, Thasian, Mene, O nethermost one, beam-embracer, savior, worldwide, dog-shaper, dog-shaped, spinner of fate, all-giver, Minoan, child of childbirth, goddess of childbirth. Uh, you see these passages confuse me. Uh, and then the magician finally declares that the bond of all necessity will be sundered, and Helios will hide your light at noon, and Tethys will o'erflow the world which you inhabit. Ions quaking, heaven will be disturbed. Cronus, in terror at your pole, or powered by force, has fled to Hades as overseer of the dead below. The Moirai throw away your endless thread, unless you check my magic's winged shaft, swiftest to reach the mark. There is a lot of arresting description here, but what interests me most is that we meet several entities who are, ha who are described as having the ability to generate significant change. The thrice-bound goddess, who is apparently Mene the moon, but also Brimo and any number of other things, such as goddess of Dodona and Ida. Clotho, one of the three fates, who spun out the thread of every mortal's life. Cerberus, the fierce guard dog of the underworld. Helios, the sun. Tethys, who is one of the primeval gods of the waters. Cronus and the Moirai, that is the three fates as a group. Most of these are characterized as having the agency to do certain things. The thrice-bound goddess can rage against the man who has angered the magician. Clotho can spin threads that determine each person's length of life. Tethys can flood the world in which the goddess dwells if she does not accede to the magician's request, and so on. The fact that so many of these are characters familiar from the Greek mythic story world enhances this effect. They already have a narratively rich history of actions that stretches back to Homer and Hesiod. Including them here is analogous to the way that Tanya's magicians drew on the novels they had read by Bradley, Tolkien, Lewis, and Renault, and on the mythological systems that they had studied to populate the narratives that empowered their own spells. Oh, apparently that slide did not switch when it was supposed to. I do apologize. Okay, there we are. My second point of focus is vividity of description. I turn first to PGM 4, 94 to 153, a love spell of attraction. It starts with what scholars of magic call a historiola, a little story that, when properly recited, is understood to bring the magical effects described in the story into our own world. Like many historioli of this period, it involves the goddess Isis, who in this case is upset because the goddess Nephthys has seduced Isis's husband, Osiris. Isis is the one who comes from the mountain at midday. In summer, the dusty maiden, her eyes are full of tears and her heart is full of sighs. 
Her father, Toth the Great, came in unto her and asked her, O oh, my daughter Isis, dusty maiden, why are your eyes full of tears, your heart full of sighs? And then a little later in the story, after Isis has told Toth why she is crying, he says, Arise, O oh my daughter Isis, and go to the south to Thebes, to the north to Abydos. Take for yourself Belth, son of Belth, the one whose foot is of bronze and whose heels are of iron, in order that he forge for you a double iron nail with a word missing head, a thin base, a strong point, and light iron. Notice here the adjectives and adjectival phrases that paint a detailed and stirring picture. Dusty, full of tears, full of sighs, the one whose foot is of bronze and whose heels are of iron. And also the very precise description of the nail that Belfel forged. All of this contributes to the overall redolence of this historiola. More generally, of course, historioli are very much like the narratives used during rituals by Tanya's subjects insofar as they work to bring power from the divine world into our own by building a narrative bridge between the two. My second example of avidity is from PGM 4, 1331 to 89, entitled Powerful Spell of the Bear That Accomplishes Anything. And bear here means the constellation of the big bear. I call on you, holy, very powerful, very glorious, very strong, holy autochthons, assistants of the great God, the powerful chief daemons, you who are inhabitants of chaos, of Erebus, of the abyss, of the depth, of earth, dwelling in the recesses of heaven, lurking in the nooks and crannies of the houses, shrouded in dark clouds, watchers of things not to be seen, guardians of secrets, leaders of those in the underworld, administrators of the infinite, wielding power over the earth, earth shakers, foundation layers, servants in the chasm, shudderful fighters, fearful ministers, turning the spindle, freezing snow and rain, cliff walkers, adverse daemons, iron-hearted, wild-tempered, unruly, guardian Tartarus, and so on and so on. Note again the vividity of language, lurking in, crooks, lurking in nooks and crannies, shrouded in dark clouds, servants in the chasm, shudderful fighters, and so on, that characterizes these autochthons, whatever they may be. This is, again, very much an evocative, as opposed to an exegetical, description of these creatures, so we are left to guess. We may not be able to locate the autochthons precisely within a hierarchy of powers after this narrative is over, or describe exactly what they look like, but we will have a strong feeling for what nature of creature they are, where they are to be found, and what they're capable of doing. I turn now to my third point of focus, visualizing a particular scene of power. I've chosen a consecration spell for all purposes, which invokes a divinity who seems to be Helios, but who is also called here Agathos Daimon. Mm. I invoke you, greatest God, eternal Lord, world ruler, who are over the world and under the world, mighty ruler of the sea, rising at dawn, shining from the east for the whole world, setting in the west. Come to me, thou who risest from the four winds, joyous Agathos Daimon, for whom heaven has become the processional way. I call upon your great and hidden names, which you rejoice to hear. The earth flourished when you shone forth, and the plants became fruitful when you laughed. The animals begat their young when you permitted. I'm particularly interested in the last part of this passage. The earth flourished when you shone forth, and the plants became fruitful when you laughed. The animals begat their young when you permitted. This evokes one of the most familiar, but also one of the most immediately glorious of the sun's powers to effect change on Earth. In doing so, it serves as an implicit guarantee of the other powers claimed for the sun in this spell, and more importantly, as a guarantee that those powers too can be called into our own quotidian world. My final topic is the way in which the spells of the papyri give us a sense of power that remains unnamed or relatively undefined, but that nonetheless has ontological and functional weight. Although I could adduce many spells of the PGM that speak of powerful unnamed entities or entities who have so many names that it's difficult to define them, I've chosen this spell, which purports to be a letter from Nefotes to Somaticus, concerning bowl divination, 
because it goes even further in what I think is an interesting direction, insofar as it claims to bestow upon the magician himself a holy power. After a formal greeting, Nefote says to Somaticus, I have sent you this magical procedure which, with complete ease, produces a holy power. The Greek word here is energia. And after you've tested it, you too will be amazed at the miraculous nature of this magical operation. And then later, after several stages of the procedure that are intended to attach the magician to Helios, including one in which the magician crowns himself with dark ivy, lies on the floor, covers his eyes with a black band, and wraps himself up like a corpse, he is told to recite a number of verses, after which a sea falcon arrives and strikes him with its wings, signifying that he should rise. Then the magician must say, I have been attached to your holy form. I have been given power, and dunamothen is the Greek here, by your holy name. I have acquired your emanation of the goods, Lord, God of gods, master, daimon, and then there's a lot of magical world, words. And then after that, the spell continues, having done this, return as a lord of a godlike nature, which is accomplished through this divine encounter. What fascinates me here is that from our point of view, the sense of what this power or emanation of the goods is and how exactly it will manifest itself within the magician is decidedly vague. The descent of the sea falcon signifies that something has changed, and if the magician is subsequently more successful at bold divination than he was before, then this will confirm that signification. But the author of the spell and its recipients seem not to be interested in the sort of details that we would love to acquire, such as, did the magician look different after the power entered him? What did the power itself look like when it entered the magician, if it could even be seen? What was it made from, exactly? What does it mean to become attached to a god? Was the sea falcon something like the dove that sometimes represents the Holy Spirit descending upon the apostles? That is, did it work to transfer power to the magician? Who knows? The magicians simply weren't interested in exegetical issues such as these. The passages that I've shown you here and the spell as a whole give a vivid sense of power and an impressive validation of the possibility of acquiring it without ever naming it or defining it. Having reviewed four types of passages from PGM4 that I uh, suggest align with the roles played by narratives in modern British magic, I want to go a little further now. Earlier I mentioned that Tanya's practitioners use an exercise called pathworking in which one person narrates a story to an audience that strives to experience the story's events in their imaginations. As they do so, they understand their imaginations to be shaping and directing the power described in the story towards a particular goal or purpose in their own world. Here again is that quotation from Tanya that I gave you earlier. And it's this sentence that is most important at the moment. I suggest that the imaginative rhetoric used to describe magical rituals may be instrumental in engendering the practitioner's confidence in the significance and validity of the practice. In the case of the ancient magical spells, I suggest that in addition to validating the magician's practices, some narratives condition the magician to actually experience what he was narrating. And those of you who were present for Tanya's lecture yesterday we'll see that we're going to be kind of dovetailing here. Um, what I'm talking about is demonstrated particularly well by the so-called Mithras Liturgy, a lengthy spell that promises that the magician will ascend into the heavens and see a variety of remarkable things. Scholars have dubbed it the Mithras Liturgy because the magician describes its origin to Helios Mithras and because Mithras himself appears to the magician at one point. Over and over, the narrator of this spell promises that we will see something if we have done what we should. I'm going to show you just some parts of this elaborate multi-stage process, and I'm highlighting in yellow the um, mention of, of seeing things. Uh, before the first part that I show you, the magician has been instructed to say a long prayer and speak magical words. And then he's told, Draw in breath from the rays, drawing up three times as much as you can. 
and you will see yourself being lifted up and ascending to the height so that you seem to be in mid-air. You will not see anything of mortal, mortal affairs on earth, but rather you will see all immortal things. For in that day and hour you will see the divine order of the skies, the presiding gods rising into heaven in other setting. Now the course of the visible gods will appear through the disk of the god, my father, and in a similar fashion the so-called pipe, the origin of the ministering wind, for you will see it hanging from the sun's disk like a pipe. You will see the outflow of this object towards the regions westward, boundless as an east wind, if it be assigned to the regions of the east, and the other, that is the west wind, if it be similarly towards its own regions. And you will see the gods staring at you intently and rushing at you. The narrator then instructs the magician to say further magical words and make certain magical sounds and continues, then you will see the gods looking graciously upon you and no longer rushing at you, but rather going about in their own order of affairs. So when you see that the world above is clear and circling and that none of the gods or angels is threatening you, expect to hear a great crash of thunder so as to shock you. Then say again, silence, silence, and the prayer, I am a star wandering about with you and shining forth out of the deep. And I will not try to pronounce the magic words. Immediately after you have said these things, the sun's disk will be expanded. And after you have said the second prayer, where there is silence, silence, and the accompanying words, make a hissing sound twice and a popping sound twice. And immediately you will see many five-pronged stars coming forth from the disk and filling all the air. And then again, say silence, silence, and when the disc is open, you will see the fireless circle and the fiery doors shut tight. And then a bit later, then again, silence the prayer. Then open your eyes and you will see the doors open and the world of the gods, which is within the doors, so that from the pleasure and joy of the sight, your spirit runs ahead and ascends. So stand still and at once draw breath from the divine into yourself while you look intently. Then when your soul is restored, say, Come, Lord, magic words, magic words. When you have said this, the rays will turn towards you. Look at the center of them. For when you have done this, you will see a youthful God, beautiful in appearance, with fiery hair, and in a white tunic and a scarlet cloak, wearing a fiery crown. After you've said these things, he will come to the celestial pole, and you will see him walking as if on a road. Look intently and make a long bellowing sound like a horn, releasing all your breath and straining at your sides and kiss the phylacteries and say, first towards the right, protect me, prosimere. After saying this, you will see the doors open and seven virgins coming from deep within, dressed in linen garments and with the faces of asps. When you see them, greet them in this manner. Now, when they take their place here and there in order, look in the air and you will see lightning bolts going down and lights flashing and the earth shaking and a God descending, a God immensely great, having a bright appearance, youthful, golden haired with a white tunic and a golden crown and trousers and holding in his right hand a golden shoulder of a young bull. This is the bear which moves and turns heaven around, moving upward and downward within the hour. Then you will see lightning bolts leaping from his eyes and stars from his body. So what are we to make of all this? From our edict point of view, the success of the spell might seem to depend upon the magician's suggestibility and his ability to narrate himself into an alternative reality by means of a gripping story. Somewhat similarly, in other spells, magicians are told to employ children to scry in a bowl of water and to talk to the child in a way that seems to condition the child to see the particular entity or thing that the magician wants him to see, although I presume the magician is doing this unconsciously, not intentionally. It works like this. The magician seats the child blindfolded in front of the scrying bowl, recites a formula that is meant to ensure success, removes the blindfold from the child's eyes, and says, do you see a light in the bowl? If the child says that he does not see a light, the magician covers the child's eyes once more, repeats the formula, removes the blindfold, and asks the question again, over and over, until it works. In other scrying spells, the child is repeatedly asked, for example, do you see Anubis, until he finally sees Anubis in the bowl. 
Psychological experiments have established that if you ask a child a question often enough, you will eventually get the answer you want because the repetition of the question gradually conditions the child to believe he has actually experienced what you're asking him about. For example, in the 1990s, um, experimenters at Cornell repeatedly asked children over the course of several weeks whether they had ever been to the hospital for an operation. Eventually, most of them responded, yes, that they'd been to the hospital, even though none of them had ever been to the hospital. So I assume that these scrying spells are working for the same reason. The purported author of the Mithras liturgy, that is, the god Helios Mithras, addresses the magician in the second person in more or less the same way as the magician addresses a child who is scrying. But the difference is that we have to presume that the voice of Helios Mithras was not actually there when the magician put the liturgy into effect to persuasively talk him through the process. Are we to imagine that the magician has memorized the entire spell so that he may speak the formulas that Helios Mithras tells him to at the appropriate times? Has he so thoroughly interiorized it that the vivid narrative of pipes descending from the sun, an expanding solar disk that shoots five-pronged stars, youthful gods clad in beautiful clothing, and asp-faced maidens becomes real to him in the course of the procedure that he performs? Well, such a feat of memorization would be quite possible in antiquity. After all, we know that whole books of the Iliad and the Odyssey were memorized. But I think we should put that assumption together with some further remarks about visualization that Tanya has discussed in her more recent book. Part of her own training to join one of the groups of magicians whom she was studying in the 1980s involved teaching her mind to focus on an internal experience. Her instruction book, written by Adam McLean of the Inner School of the Hermetic Journal, told her, you should perform a meditation building up an inner picture of a walled garden. Initially make it four square with an expansive empty lawn in its center. After an initial centering and when the bubbling of your consciousness has to some extent quietened and abated, begin to see the center point of your consciousness with inner pictures of the garden, using all the senses if you wish. Then withdraw a little inward and let these images become wrapped around your inner point of soul. Then reseed the inner picture if you need to. Tanya goes on to say that after about a year of training, her mental imagery became clearer. She thought her images had sharper borders, felt more solid and lasted longer. And she began to have more anomalous experiences by which she meant events that are unusual in the everyday world visions, voices, a sense of presence, out-of-body experiences. Indeed, one morning, she awoke to see druids standing outside her window. Unfortunately, they vanished when she stood up, but for a moment, she really saw them. You probably see where I'm going with this. It's possible, indeed, to me it seems probable, that ancient magicians trained themselves in cultivating inner experiences, just as Tanya had. Tanya trained herself to see an increasingly detailed garden. My magicians may have trained themselves to see angels and gods and shooting stars and asp-faced maidens in an environment in which the magician could actually interact with them. In closing, I want to return to the title of my paper, Narrating Reality in the Great Paris Magical Papyrus. Great Paris, ah, Narrating Reality in the Ancient Magical Papyri. I mean that in two senses. One is that narratively rich passages, such as those we've been looking at, depict the world as the magician genuinely understood it to be, vibrantly filled with an abundance of gods, daimones, angels, ghosts, and other entities that could help him accomplish an astonishing variety of aims. The other is that such narratively rich passages create the world of the magician by activating it, by bringing it into such a state of existence that its power is enabled to flow into our own. In this sense, almost all narrative passages in the PGM operate in the same way as those historioli, those little stories do, whether they're telling a linearly complete story or not. I've only just begun this project. My next steps will include reading more about contemporary magicians so that I might better understand what happens when they read and share narratives. 
Since Tanya's 1989 book, a number of further studies have appeared, which will help me with that. I also need to think more about how the magicians who used the papyri may have differed from contemporary magicians and witches and their consumption of narratives. One salient point, I think, is that contemporary magicians have many more formative narratives to draw on than ancient magicians did, and those narratives are much more readily available to them. Hmm. I will talk a little more loudly, I think. At the time that Tanya wrote her book, it was easy to find copies of Lord of the Rings, The King Must Die, and so on in libraries and secondhand bookstores. Any aspiring magician could immerse himself in those worlds. It was also easy to get hold of books on Greek and Celtic mythology. Indeed, Sabina Malioko, another scholar of contemporary witchcraft, has characterized contemporary witches and magicians as very much given to what she calls poaching in the stacks. That is, she gives Michel Desserteaux's concept of modern humans as textual poachers a twist that reflects witches and magicians' deep dedication to reading all kinds of things that make way into their rituals and narratives. What can we say of the ancient magicians in this respect? Witchcraft, as, as I've noticed, they certainly knew their Homer and Hesiod well. As very much and given they to knew what she other Greek myths, in the Egyptian stacks. myths, Israelite, and that Christian is, she gives too. Michel de Certeau's but concept through what of routes, modern humans as textual and poachers, can we discern a, a twist that reflects witches and magicians' indeed, time deep dedication magicians. to reading all kinds of things With these that make way into I their you now and narrative. And I look forward to what can we say of the ancient magicians in this respect? As I've noted, they certainly knew their Homer and Hesiod well. And they knew other Greek myths, Egyptian myths, Israelite, and Christian stories, too. But through what routes? And can we discern a corpus of favorites, as Thank indeed so much, Tanya did uh, for, for her this, magicians? Uh, incredibly stimulating with talk. these questions, uh, I leave you we'll now, to, I think, we'll and talk, I look forward uh, to music, your uh, questions. Because there is an alumni uh, weekend going on, so we'll just uh, try to be louder. Um, <laughs> I will moderate the discussion for uh, Sara and do you have a mic or um, can you put, there's one on the desk, can oh, you? Oh, this, okay, yes, this okay. Awesome, thank you. Um, so, um, <laughs> I open the floor for questions and please let me know when, yes. I think it certainly could. Um, Sorry, so the question that I Yes, the question is, uh, or rather, first there was a statement that some people have argued that for the Mithras liturgy, some of the images that the magician is supposed to see echo those that are found in some Mithraea, some temples to Mithras. And did this have um, something to do with what's going on in the Mithras liturgy? Generally, I would say, um, even though I talked about verbal narratives, in what I was saying today, I think the artistic narratives of myth would have been very significant as well. I don't think probably the magician was literally in a Mithraeum, but I think it's quite possible, in fact, again, I think it's probable that he would have been familiar with some of that imagery. Certainly, he would have known what Mithras looked like. Good, good point. I should really talk more about visual images as well. Thank you. Uh, Andre? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, this was a wonderful, splendid, splendid talk and uh, with many insightful uh, observations. And uh, I really appreciated the way that you brought to the fore which aspects of somatic experiences are present in the narration. So it is not just visualization in the sense of seeing scenes. It is also the uh, uh, production of sounds, hissing, popping, bellowing. <laughs> it's a complete somatic experience also in the uh, sense of uh, what you feel with, with your feet trembling of the floor and so on. Mm. Um, so it's a kind of a, a completely embodied experience of, of the magician and presumably of the fire, I assume. 
So my first question would relate to the differences between a magician and a client. Do you see any? Uh, I know it's a difficult question to speculate about, but anything that you could uh, tell us? I, I don't think the client experienced any of this. Okay. Um, Radcliffe Edmonds' article is really good. If you're interested in magic, I would um, urge you to look at it. It's, a, it's in an issue of Archiv for Religionsgeschichte about two years ago. Um, the reason I'm referring to that is that Radcliffe really is making a very strong argument contradicting a number of other people such as Chris Ferroni. Radcliffe is saying the, really the only people who ever would have seen these spells are the magician. And so the magician is saying to the client, I'll go back to my place and I'll do what I need to do to make this work for you. And sometimes he's then going back to the client and saying, and now here's your amulet or whatever. So that's what first, I, I read Radcliffe's article before it was published, and that's what kind of first set me thinking along the lines that I've gotten to. So the short answer to your question is it's only, for me anyway, it's only the magician himself. The client doesn't get to see or hear any of this. Yeah. I would, I would agree with that. Uh, perhaps one difference that now uh, um, compared to Radcliffe's views that I would have is that uh, it is the client that sometimes has to perform some of the uh, very odd rituals, uh, such as sacrifices, which are very atypical, dedications, as you pointed out, you know, of various things you know, that have to be acquired and so on. So I think that uh, also the client partakes in the narration, but in a different way. Um, because it's a, it's, it's a step aside from the traditional ritual that one would be performing, I imagine. You're, you're absolutely right that there are spells where the client is told to sacrifice a dung beetle or something exactly. weird like that. Yeah. No, you're right, and I shouldn't have glossed over that. I, I do think the client might have been doing stuff that right. the magician told him to do. I don't think the client was experiencing anything like what the Mithras liturgy describes and probably wasn't experiencing most of what I talked about in the first examples in my yes. paper thank either. Thank you very much and thank you for bringing up uh, Mithras literature. I have more questions but I don't want to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does anyone want to interact or then we can move, we can move to, oh, Tanya. Tanya, okay, and then we'll come back to you. Do you want the microphone? Uh, you could just repeat this. Okay, sure. Okay, so I learned so much when Oh, good. It's just amazing. I was afraid um, you'd say, Sarah, you're out of your mind. This is not at all what I meant. No. But when I sort of talked to my anthropological colleagues and made the claim that what I saw with Brit British magicians might help to explain Trobrian magic, mm -hmm. um, people, the pushback I get is, oh, they thought so differently about mental things. There's no evidence. That they that intention interiority mattered. So when I hear, so this is very exciting to hear you speak. Um, and it seems to me that the Mithras um, liturgy lit yeah. liturgy does contain evidence within it that intention, inner state, what's going on with the magician really matters. Is that the it, so you're you're nodding and you're saying yes? Is that the only evidence we have? Or does it pop up elsewhere? It pops up in little ways elsewhere. I was bringing in kind of the, the gold standard example. Um, it's so clear to me in the Mithras liturgy. I also would comment, I understand why your colleagues working on the Trovery and Islanders might be making that comment, but intentionality is a tricky word. You in the 1980s with your groups, yeah, you had a kind of fully developed modern concept of intentionality and you knew what you were doing. I don't think the magicians that I'm talking about quite had that, but I think there was intentionality. I think they knew if I bring myself in this state of mind, if I'm in this particular room in my house, if I'm sitting on this particular um, piece of uh, tapestry, now I'm ready to go. And then they they go, you know, with the text that I would argue they've memorized, they start going and they see that just as you saw your garden. Mm -hmm. And they see the snake-faced maidens just as you saw your druids. Mm -hmm. I envy you so much for that. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. That's great. Okay. Yes, please, in the back. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so when I heard uh, you speaking to uh, Professor Lerman's um, experience with the druids versus
context, there was a sense in which um, those sorts of effects could also be created without the spoken word, or is that essential too? Um, so the question is whether orality was essential to ancient magic. Not all ancient magic. Sometimes, in fact, writing was considered to be more powerful to perform certain actions, like a curse tablet. You might speak the curse as you're creating the tablet, but by writing it and then depositing it in a significant place, such as a grave, you've essentially activated the curse to keep saying itself over and over and over and over. So writing could be important, and we see writing in the magical papyri. Um, the other part of answering your question is that, so we know we have these papyri where someone has written the spells out, but it's a little bit like a cookbook insofar as I'll read the cookbook and when Adelenghi says, beat your eggs, I pause reading and I beat the eggs, then I go back and read whatever the next thing is that he says, right? So the papyri are like that insofar as they'll say, um, you know, stand on one foot, touch your head, and say the following. So the magician does that and goes back and does the next thing. I would argue, and I'm not the only one, that in fact the magician had memorized all this so that unlike me reading Adelenghi, he's not going, uh, he knows, oh yeah, this is the next thing I do. So I hope that answers your question, but if I didn't, ask again. Because I think there was a lot packed into your question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For, um, for the most part, yeah. Just I mean, even in the sense that if the magician had, had memorized all of this, there was there was always a, um, a a physical component to it as well. There was never it never um, passed the point where it's like a purely you know seated meditation and imagine at this kind of thing. And in that Probably way, not for most of the spells. The Mithras liturgy, I think there are very, very long parts that could have been completely seated and what we would call meditative. But you're right that I can't think of a spell that does not include some ritual action, however small, even if it's only first put on your amulet or first put on a wreath of myrtle leaves or, or something like that. And I don't know whether Tanya's practitioners had those things too when they entered into these pathworking exercises. Were they supposed to be dressed in certain ways or holding certain things? Well, on the Monday evening pagan pathfinders, we just showed up in our grubbies. Okay. And, but we weren't doing real magic. But when people did what they considered to be real magic, they also had props. Okay. Probably not. I mean, I think it varied uh, between groups, and uh, it, I suspect it varies between, I mean, who knows? Mm -hmm. but, they, but when they were doing magic that counted, they wanted to have props. Okay. And they were, sometimes they were very elaborate, sometimes not so much. That's true of Christians as well. You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. Okay, we have uh, Camilla and then Jenny and then in the back. Okay, Camilla, go ahead. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I have a question. If we take um, the magicians to be the primary audience uh, of this text uh, and not like a medium in between uh, a larger audience and uh, the text itself, do we have any evidence that they thought that the text were revealed? Like that the God uh, himself Um, yes, I should explain maybe a little bit more how we think these spells get into papyri. At some point, someone has a revelation. Let's stick to the Mithras liturgy. We, presu we presume that at some point, someone gets a revelation from Helios Mithras. And um, so let's call him Magician A. And he then talks to his pal, Magician B, and says, gosh, I've got this really cool thing. 
and gives it to Magician B. And you can see where I'm going with this, that the person who wrote what we now call the Great Paris Magical Papyrus may not be the person who got the revelation himself from Helios Mithras. That may be several you know, links in the chain back. But it is presumed to be a revelation, just as um, when a Christian reads the book of Revelation, well, not all Christians believe this, but you see where I'm going. A Christian is supposed to believe that the book of Revelation really was a revelation to John. So I hope that answers your question. other sources. What comes to my mind right away are sources for what is called theurgy, which is another strand of magic in antiquity that is, it's really hard to describe how it's different from the PGM. In most ways it's not. It's just that theurgists aren't supposed to be using their power to do things like um, create love spells or for that matter curses. Theurgists are only supposed to be working for what we would call good. But we do have very, very similar theurgic texts like these. So it's not standing alone, but there's not too much other stuff like this. Right? Yeah, simple question. Um, how is this different from a kind of, uh, you know, well, you mentioned theurgy, but also um, saints, mystical experiences, which are also trained. I mean, it doesn't, usually doesn't just happen. And the images that are then seen belong to a certain class of religious things, like seeing the Virgin Mary and so on. Um, you mentioned just at the end um, the purpose. Uh, is that the distinguishing feature between, we could mm -hmm. talk about magicians, um, and many of the images here reminded me of the Apocalypse um, of John. Um, yeah. Are they different? So, <clears throat> to repeat the question, uh, Jenny is asking how what I'm talking about is similar to or different from the visions that some saints have, which, as she quite rightly says, are sometimes, um, uh, I forget the word that you use, but self-guided, that you have to be trained to have them. Um, I think, in fact, it's very much the same thing. And I do think you're right that one of the differences is that at the end of a saint's vision, it doesn't say, and this will cause great love in whomever you wish, or this will cause um, so-and-so to lose in the chariot races. And I think that's partly because Christianity is a religion of the book, and so the saints aren't really supposed to be adding to the New Testament, right? And so I think that's one reason that their visions go in that different direction. But the other thing that your question um, puts into greater context for me is when I first started dabbling in this project, as I said a couple years ago, and was looking for models of magic that would help with the PGM, I was looking at what's called Solomonic magic, which has a long history in Europe. And if you, you know, read something about um, European magic in the 18th century, it's gonna be Solomonic. And Solomonic magic is really different from this. Solomonic magic focuses on excruciatingly careful preparation of absolutely everything like, you know, you have to have a quill made from the seventh feather on the left wing of a goose that has never laid an egg. I'm not kidding. I'm not making that up. And there's a little bit of that in the PGM, but nowhere near as much as in uh, Solomonic magic. And Solomonic magic has very little of what I'll call visualization. Okay, so to get back to the point of what Jenny's question made me think of, um, you make me suddenly see it as if some aspects of what I'll call ancient Greek magic or ancient Mediterranean magic are going off in this direction and get used in Solomonic magic and then exaggerated, exaggerated to this great extent. But this other aspect of Greek magic kind of gets subsumed by mysticism, by what we call mysticism. And in something like PGM4, we're still seeing those two things together. Uh, what about, just to follow up, what about the saints that then can heal, they're actually doing something. 
That's uh, true. Uh, which, is that magic? Is that something else? Is healing the same as magic? Isn't that the million dollar question? <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. I guess it depends on how the congregation feels about it. But you're right uh, that sometimes the vision comes with an ability to heal. So yeah, that muddies the categories even further. Uh, I mean, we do have in the Greek magical spells, spells for healing of a headache or even anger management. And yep. that's still considered to be magic. But I don't think we have more ordinary things like, um, you know, to staunch the flow of blood. Well, we do. Yeah, yeah, we do. You see why the PGM are both fascinating and frustrating. It's very hard to define exactly what they are and are not. You're right. There was a question in the back. So, oh, no, no, next. I, I don't know your name. I'm really sorry. Uh, so the lady, yes. the third, no, next to you, with glasses. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. as attention as a constructive world building activity. I was wondering if you might respond to that. I, I think that's a really good way to express it. You've done it more elegantly than I did. I think that's exactly right, that intention to us has such a deliberate meaning and attention is a better way to describe this. So thank you. And, and what is your name? Blaine. Blaine, okay. I, I want to remember who gave me that very nice <laughs> articulation. Okay, great, thank you. Andre, shall we go back to your questions? Sure, absolutely. Yes. And, uh, so, I think what, you, what you're doing is exceptionally important uh, uh, with the focus on the narrative and uh, the way that it's, it's uh, constructed. And uh, you mentioned that, of course, magicians are aware of their Homer and, and Hesiod. Uh, for something like Mithras literature, which is a text extremely uh, detailed and uh, very developed, and it plays on so many experiences of, of the person ascending and so on. This, what, what the person ascending sees is extremely vivid, as you wonderfully shown. Do you think that a uh, magician either directly or indirectly was influenced by rhetorical treatises on things like anarchia, on vividness? Or would you say this is unlikely due to the uh, nature of uh, uh, the, the papyri themselves? I'm not sure what the answer is. I just wanted to speculate a little. So just to repeat what Andre said, um, he's asking whether the magicians might have been influenced by rhetorical treatises. I think it's quite possible. If most of these magicians are operating in Egypt, um, and clearly they have at what we would call education because they know their Homer, they know their Hesiod. I'm going to eventually argue when I finish this work that they knew Ovid's Metamorphoses very well, yada, yada, yada. So why wouldn't they also know rhetorical treatises? I never thought of that before, but I think it's quite possible. Well, I didn't think of it either until you brought up Mithras liturgy and shown the, the, all these scenes of the, what, what, how, how this world is constructed. And because this is a, the world making is part of, of um, rhetorical exercises as well. So. Oh, you mean like memory palaces? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. that's, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, did they get another question? I'm sorry. Did, did, did the ancient Greeks, you have memory palaces? Of course, yes, yes. yes. It was invented by a guy called Simonides in the uh, late East, early fifth century. Yes. Oh, we see course. as they came up with this mnemonic system. I mean, I'm not going to go into detail. <laughs> the guy was attending a party, the roof collapsed. Yeah, 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 no, I, know the story. I didn't yeah. realize it was widely used. It was used in, yeah, it, it became a local Cicero, memorial, yes. exactly, Cicero, and later on it was um, appropriated for all sorts of things like learning hundreds mm. uh, of names by heart, mm. for instance. So people claimed that they know each okay. citizen in the city and so on. So they used these, these uh, memory books, as it were. Cool. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I'll, I'll happily steal it from you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I have one. Oh, no, Let's go, uh, Just a... Uh, Go ahead. <clears throat> Just a, an obvious, I mean, a, a point you probably already considered, but um, 
the Hermetica, have you been looked at, and, and how that relates to what you're talking about? Because a lot of what you're talking about, this visualization and this pathway sort of uh, scenario really reminded me of, of um, the Hermetic corpus and especially mm -hmm. the, the Tat being sort of shown the world um, and so forth. It seems to me as though there's a significant overlap with, with the poem Andres and, and with like the fifth Hermetic re revelation and so forth. Uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. John was asking mm -hmm. whether I had taken into account the Hermetica as comparanda. I kind of cheated and folded those into theurgy a minute ago mm -hmm. when I was answering the question, but you're absolutely right. The Hermetica and especially the Poimandres, I think are a great analogy for this as well. And the accent on the visual is so, so prominent there. And I was gonna further ask a, a question in your, the, what you're translating in that, towards the end of your talk where you're accenting all those words for seeing, mm -hmm. what, the, what, the, what the Greek verbs are in those situations, because it seems to me that, that really important, especially in the Hermetic tradition, is this idea of, of theostai, of beholding, which is a, a sort of a, a more layered and rich concept than you know, just common garden variety seeing. So I, I this is the common garden variety scene. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't occur to me, you're making a very good point, that the fact that it's not theosai is interesting. I, I need to ponder that. So Nikki asked a bunch of really interesting questions rolled into one. Um, and I'll kind of make two statements. And if there's still stuff you want me to talk about, I will. One is that the Greek concept of the imagination, what we would call the imagination, had also a more active outward reaching role potentially, particularly in some philosophical systems, so that it was it's kind of going back to what Tanya talks about um, with her magicians who by visualizing the power are bringing the power into the world. Similarly, by imagining stuff, some magicians at least may have thought that they were literally bringing it into the world. I can't prove that, but it would fit with uh, certain other stuff going on in antiquity. The other thing, you're talking about tropes. What were their, um, where were they getting their tropes? And I presume what you mean by that is sort of going back to the, the visual images when we were talking about the Mithraea, for example. Certainly there were famous visual representations of particular gods, goddesses, et cetera. So if, if they were familiar with those, those surely would have colored what they expected to see. Um, you were asking something more than that though, I know, and I'm not sure I understood what the other part of your question about visuality was. It's the, the, the kind of training and the attachment we have to oh, our visualizations. Right. And I'm really thinking about this because of your comment last night about Orpheus. 
<laughs> Orpheus, right, shouldn't have had red hair in your mind. And so the way in which we visualize contributes to yeah. the world in which we make. And so to what extent are we coming with a, uh, you know, a culturally coded set of expectations? And then how do those expectations then uh, manifest different worlds on the basis of yeah. how closely they correlate? So last night I was complaining that I saw a traveling, um, uh, well, a, I, saw, I saw a presentation of Hades Town in Columbus. And the guy who played Orpheus had bright red hair. And I was very distressed by this, even though, of course, my dear husband leaned across to me and said, but Orpheus was Thracian. He can have red hair. <laughs> I nonetheless thought, no, not red hair, and was distressed. And the other thing that we were talking about last night is the book that I have coming out, which is a narration of Greek myths, was illustrated by my son, who's a professional illustrator. And of course, I've been telling him these myths his whole life. And he and I have had disagreements on what Hades should look like, for example. And you know, I think his Athena is not exactly what I imagined. And we've had to make peace with this. So I do understand what you're getting at, because this is what I'm, I'm living myself. I don't know. I, I mean, as I said, they would have had popular statues or representations to look at. But I presume that if they grew up in this world, they had their own little Zeus in their head. and if the spell is about Zeus, I presume that's what they're picturing, and that these adjectives are supplementing that, but they're not replacing the picture of Zeus. But I, I'm just kind of guessing here. Well, if, if I may to interject just on that point, it, it seems to me that a, a lot of the stories that we have in sort of the archaic and classical uh, period uh, uh, warn people about imagining or seeing the gods, really witnessing seeing the gods is not something that you want to happen to you because disaster strikes, people go blind, uh, or even the magnificent representations of the gods are just meant to be approximations but not the real thing. So this sort of the yearning to see uh, and especially to sort of ascend with your soul and see the world of, as it really is, as Plato would say, seems to me to really like start with Plato, who is very into describing in extremely vivid imagery what the, the, the world is like that we see with your soul, with our soul, the world of the, the, work of the, the, world of the gods, and then you know, to make his question. So powerful were these images that there was an anecdotal tradition of people reading about the soul and just dying, killing themselves. <laughs> Uh, because I guess I think they wanted to see. Um, so there is a culture, I would say, you know, in Greek culture, there is a, it's, it's at first there is a great reticence about witnessing the, the mm -hmm. gods, and you know, they're not supposed to be witnessed. Um, you can imagine them, I suppose, but not really see them. Yeah, so, that's true. If, if you see Zeus, you could be incinerated like Semele was, but I guess I would respond by saying the magician has specially trained and protected himself. And phylactery, of course. It yeah, has. phylactery. <laughs> yeah. So there was a question there and then a son. Yes, um, go ahead. So you responded to some archetypes in your comment on imagination, but I'm thinking about the role of narratives in horror stories that you discussed yesterday and in what essentially seems to be an instruction manual today. And I'm wondering. So she was asking about the difference between the way that yesterday I talked about narrative working in horror stories and the way that I see narrative working in the PGM today. Um, one big difference is that the narratives in the PGM, most of them are barely there. In other words, they're being gestured to. Like there's another spell that I didn't show you, which uh, includes the magician invoking myrrh, the, the incense, but with a capital M, and so it's myrrh who uh, in mythology is a girl who has very unfortunate experiences and eventually becomes a myrrh tree. And so the magician is um, invoking myrrh. 
And he's saying, I'm going to send you somewhere now to do what he wants her to do. And he says, I'm not sending you to Arabia. I'm not sending you to Babylon. And people who know the myth know that that's basically where the mythic character ended up. So the magician is sort of drawing on his knowledge of the narrative, but then he's using it for completely different reasons. And similarly, um, in one spell, Aphrodite is being threatened by the magician. And the magician says, if you don't do what I want you to, I will never let Adonis rise from Hades again. And that's alluding to a myth about how Adonis spends half his time below, half his time above, and when he's above, he's with Aphrodite. So he, the magician knows the narratives, but he's manipulating them. He's giving them agency in a really interesting way. Sona? Um, let me first check with Ashley. How are we doing on time? Um, that's the gist of your last question. Oh, goodness. <laughs> well, then in that case, let me say everyone is welcome to lunch, which we'll be serving right after, after we applaud our speaker. Is it okay if I ask? Yeah. Okay, so here there's a request and then a question. Okay. Would it be okay if I read you a magical incantation from the Atharva Veda? Yes. All right. So this is 800 BC or thereabouts, give or take. Oh, I don't know. This is South Asia, so 200 c centuries or so. That's pretty good, though. Okay. So. Sona, why don't you come here and take the mic? Oh, but I feel like I'm. Oh. No, take it. Okay. Actually, and this is for all our, our guests during the symposium, but Sarah first, and then I'll be curious to hear what Tani and Nikki think too. So um, one of the nicest things about hearing talks like this, it helps me rethink stuff I think I know, like this stuff, like, hearing, like looking at this literature made me rethink the Atharva, which is awesome for philosophy of time and magic. So here we go. As the bowstring from the bow, thus I take off your anger from your heart. So that having become of the same mind, we will associate like friends. Look, like friends, we shall associate. I take off your anger. Under a stone that is heavy, I will cast your anger. I step upon it with my heel and my forefoot, so that bereft of will, you will not speak. You will come to my wish. So that's the spell, <coughs> right? Um, so I guess one of the questions I had was, a commentator on this, a really a superb scholar, said, it is unclear what ritual action is specified here. <coughs> but I think that's a mistake. At least for Vedic, there are actions of speech, of body, and of mind. These are the actions, right? As the bowstring from the bow, I take off your anger from, that's the action, I'm doing it, I'm thinking it, intending it or attending to this possibility, right? Is there something like that? this typology of possible actions on which imagination is the action and then accompanied by others or how are they thinking of action? See, I would have presumed that as the person is saying that, he is literally unstringing a bow. He's literally unstringing. That's okay. very interesting. Um, because there are certainly Greek magical actions like that where you do something such as you pierce a cursed tablet with a nail right. And you're supposed to say, I am piercing this tablet. And so. Do you think there is? That's lovely. This is really easy. Really. <coughs> well, I mean, I would guess that's what they're doing, but boy, that's way outside of my wheelhouse. So I don't. What were the Vedic guys, right? These poets, the, the whole, the reason you have the poet and the ritualist are overlapping, um, uh, have overlapping functions, is that the entire ritual is imagined into being through language. Oh. Right? And, and so th there's actually very little ritual construction. There is a ritual ground created. But the, the hymn creates the vehicle that actually conveys and, trans and does the transformed. So you don't need to actually be unstringing a bow. But they could be. I don't know. See, this is beautiful. Uh, that's why I wanted your thoughts on it. I don't know. Surely someone must work on Vedic magic. Or I'm sure they know. Is it beyond my pay grade? I, yeah, I don't know they who it is. They jobs, but I'm sure they do. <laughs> hey, I got a job working on even worse, theurgy, and I managed to get a That's job. That's a beautiful Thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, let us all thank uh, Sara and uh, uh, our discussants uh, very heartily for an amazing paper and a great discussion that we have just witnessed. Thank you very much.